we are going to be recording this so um, just so that you know that we will send you the link um, or the you'll be able to view this video please keep your mics off uh, I will mute um, I will mute you uh, except for Chanel I'll mute everybody else just so that uh, there's no background noise yeah perfect um, there's a chat bar at the bottom here. You can just chat on, uh, you can talk on the chat bar. You can say hi, introduce yourself, say where you are from. And um, if you have any questions, please pop the questions there. Chanel is going to be watching them when I talk and I'm going to be watching them when she talks and then we can answer questions in the question section at the bottom. Cool, let's go. Um, Chanel's going to introduce me. Okay, thank you, Athenia. So it's a, a big and a great pleasure for me to introduce um, our first speaker to you tonight, which is Athenia. So like she said, we are in um, BNI together and she's a grief and trauma counsellor, a life coach, um, an executive coach, a lifeline lay counsellor, a certified hypnotherapist and a volunteer at Headway Gauteng. She has got a Bachelor of Arts in psych, uh, Psychological Counseling um, and she's, con she's completed seven of eight subjects for the BA Honours in Psychology, um, of psychology Psychological um, <laughs> Counseling. Um, in, she's got lots of uh, therapy practice and then um, she's got her own therapy practice called Love and Light, which we are joining tonight. Um, and she has facilitated over 340 sessions. Most of her clientele have experienced trauma and she tend to get a lot of sexual trauma clients coming to see her for counseling. So welcome, Athenia. Thank you. Thank you. So it's been in this where I've been working with my, with my trauma clients that I've actually realized and I've, I've seen how there is this link between um, trauma and obesity. And a lot of the clients that have come to me have actually, they are, they're overweight. And, and when we go back and we have a look at what's happened, it's actually because of the fact that they have had trauma in their lives. And there's different forms of trauma. We're going to have a look at that. Um, and, and, and you can, you can often see, or you can, you can identify with yourself. If you have had any trauma in your life, when we go through the different types of trauma, you can maybe identify, maybe this is part of where your weight, if you are struggling with your weight, where your weight has come from. Um, so one of the things with uh, weight is that we often hang on to weight and it protects us. So what is your weight protecting you from? Um, we know that we've been told that we need to exercise, we need to eat um, healthy, we need to portion control, we need to get on that treadmill that most of us love. The only person I know that loves running is Chanel. Um, yeah. Uh, and we've also been told that obviously there can be um, a link with your thyroid. If you have an underactive thyroid, um, then very often you, you do struggle with weight gain. Uh, but a lot of women are not actually overweight because of portion control or because of um, the diet that they eat. Very often you'll find somebody that eats only vegetables and only uh, protein and has a perfect thyroid and goes to gym five days a week and yet they just cannot shift um, their weight. And it actually is because they have the trauma and the emotional component of it. So they, they're trying very hard to protect themselves um, and they're hanging on to their weight. Um, we always hear about how to, you know, you, you always hear these different um, diets and all kinds of ways, how to lose weight permanently. You know, you must do this, you must do that. But very often, these things don't actually work for us um, because we haven't actually dealt with the underlying reason as to why we're hanging on to our weight. So if trauma has impacted you, um, these are the different kinds. Uh, there are different, there's plenty of different types of trauma, but these are some of them that I have encountered. Um, there's a spelling mistake. Uh, <laughs> If we perceive obesity, right, if we perceive obesity to be, to be unattractive, okay, and you've had an experience in the past where there's been some sort of sexual trauma, very often people hold onto their weight so they stay overweight because it kind of, it protects them because society thinks that obesity is not attractive and therefore if I hold onto my weight, perhaps what happened to me when I was three or four or five or seven or 12 actually will not happen again. Um, it's a way of protecting myself uh, from further uh, predators, let's call them. Another form of trauma could be bullying, and we're going to talk about that. 
and then unresolved grief. Perhaps there's been stuff in your life that you haven't actually worked through and then also limiting beliefs. So we're going to work through these now individually. Um, the, the, they've done studies and people who have experienced trauma of any form are four times more likely to become an alcoholic, four times more likely to develop a sexually transmitted disease, four times more likely to inject drugs, three times more likely to use antidepressant medication, three times more likely to be absent from work, 15 times more likely to commit suicide. And a lot of the people that I see in my therapy practice, they will come and they'll say to me, you know, I'm, I'm done, I'm, I'm so, I'm just done. Um, between the weight and the rest of my life, I'm just, I'm so over it. Um, 2.5 times more likely to smoke tobacco, three times more likely to have serious job problems and three times more likely to experience depression. So it's just good to have an understanding of people that have been through trauma. These are the kind of things that could possibly put them at risk. Uh, so what is the connection actually? What is the connection between sexual abuse and developing an eating disorder? The answer is guilt, shame, anesthesia, meaning that I actually just want to numb myself all the time because I actually just don't want to feel. Uh, Self-punishment, soothing, comfort, protection, and rage. If you look at these stats here, before they turn 18, one in six boys will experience some form of sexual abuse and one in four girls experience uh, some form of sexual abuse. I am, in my practice, I'm absolutely shocked to just, when I sit with people, it's just fascinating to hear how many times, you know, these things have been happening. And very often, unfortunately, it's actually family members um, that they've been, they've been, you know, somebody's done something to them and hurt them in some way. Uh, very often, it's, it's, it's always a family member or some form of, of member who's been part of the family. So sexual abuse can have many different effects on the eating habits and on the body images of survivors. Uh, sexual abuse violates the boundaries of the self so dramatically that inner sensations of hunger, fatigue, or sexuality become difficult to identify. So because of, you're just so violated and you don't even know, actually, you're not connected to your body in any way anymore. You just feel so separated from it you actually don't know if you're hungry actually don't know if you're tired and obviously sexuality is very very often um, impacted as well people who have been sexually abused may turn to food to relieve a wide range of different states of tension that have actually got nothing to do with the hunger it's in their confusion and their uncertainty about what's happening inside of them that uh, leads them to focus on the food there's this vicious cycle where they eat they feel bad about it and then they stress about oh my word now i've eaten again or they stress about something else then they need comfort then they need to eat then they do eat and it just keeps going and there's regret about eating there's regret about their weight there's shame and there's guilt and these uh, emotional we're going to talk about emotional eating now but all these emotions just it's just this vicious cycle that just doesn't stop uh, many survivors of sexual abuse often work to become very fat or very thin. So not everybody is obese who has had trauma, um, and not everybody that's had uh, that's not everybody that is obese has had trauma, and not everybody who's had trauma is obese. Very often, they can be the other way around. There are a lot of people that um, will go the other way, as you can see this lovely, beautiful model down here who's so um, immense, emancipated. I think that's the word, emancipated. Um, also, trauma can uh, in people that have had, that have got any autoimmune disease, uh, fibromyalgia, lupus. Very often, those people have also experienced trauma in their lives, and so their body is literally manifesting pain all the time. Um, if we, if that, so when we when we have been sexually abused, or if we have been sexually abused, they actually try to desexualize themselves, whether it's too skinny or too or 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 overweight. Either way. They either don't want the unwanted attention or they're trying desperately to be perfect because they've been taught somewhere along the line that they actually were never perfect or never good enough. A perfect body is their attempt to feel more powerful, invulnerable, and in control. So as not to re-experience that powerlessness. So when somebody was dealing, when somebody was hurting you or so when somebody was, you know, doing something to you and you were being traumatized, um, there's a feeling of powerlessness. And the most powerful feeling in the world is being in control control of yourself, your surroundings, your skills, and your mindsets. Now, when you're a child, obviously, you are not in control if that is happening to you. And so it makes you feel completely small, completely childlike. And it then encourages all of these 
out of control behaviors, one of them is of course eating. Um, another reason that we eat is to feed the grief. So if, for example, there was grief in the trauma or if there's just grief, so very often if you have lost a loved one, we just want to feel better um, and we just need to feel like we're okay. So we're always filling ourselves with food um, so that we can just fill that hole, that void that's inside. And we just, you know, we feel better when we eat. So we just, that's what we want to do. We just want to eat so that we can actually feel like, like we're okay. And, um, you know, we don't have to actually deal with all of the underlying emotions because it's just, it's just, it's just too hard to deal with. So it's easier to do it this way. And we get to that place where it's just out of control. Some people have actually have out of control eating where they just never stop. Another form of trauma is bullying. 64% um, of teenagers in weight loss programs um, have been teased or bullied because of their weight. And that's just crazy that teenagers should have to deal with this. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's really, really fair. 42% was by a coach or even a PT, PE teacher or physical education teacher. 37% was by a parent and 27% was by a teacher. I think what's important to recognize here is the fact that very often children are actually bullied even before um, they actually are overweight. So I've had um, quite a few clients where they've come to me and the, 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 the bullying by their parents has started as young as like when they were seven. You know, if somebody comes to a kid and says at seven, I must take you to Weight, weight Watchers or Weigh Less and, and the child's seven um, and they weren't even overweight, that is a form of bullying. And that is one way of setting that kid up for a lifetime of, um, you know, weight issues that they're going to always have to deal with. So this is one of the forms of trauma. Bullying is trauma because it attacks your personal self and it makes you feel like you are not good enough and it should never have happened to you. Uh, the other thing is limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs, we have a lot of limiting beliefs about our weight. Um, you know, we get taught a lot of things. Uh, and here are some. So what I thought we could do is just look through them and maybe just make a, like, make a tick in your, in your head or, you know, as you're thinking it through. Do these resonate for you? Do you feel like, you know, these are true for you? Um, my bones are too big. You hear that, you hear people say I'm big boned. You hear a lot of people say I'm big boned. We actually heard it yesterday in my house and I said, it's weird because when you look at skeletons, you couldn't actually tell the difference. If it was a boy or a girl, you wouldn't actually know, right? Because they're not really, I mean, they're not. They might be, might be a slightly bigger, but it's not massively big. The bones are the same. I'm not a sporty person. It's so hard to lose weight. It's better to be fat and happy rather than fat and miserable. I like that. Uh, to get rid of the extra pounds, I have to go to the gym and I hate the gym. Some are just naturally thin and others are just not so lucky. It's impossible to stay in shape after a given age. Normally it's 40. Um, the only way to slim down is to starve yourself. It's genetic. Everyone in my family is big. It's in my genes. It's just my fate to be like that. Uh, if I manage somehow to shed off a couple of pounds, I always end up getting them back, gaining more. It's expensive to stay in shape. I'm sure you must hear that a lot, Chanel. It's expensive to eat healthy. Yeah, a lot of people say that. It takes too much time and I can't really afford it. I'm supposed to have six small meals a day. How is that not complicated? Food is not to be thrown away because children in Africa are starving. Have you heard this? Did anybody hear this? Just raise your hand or your, your thingy. My mother always used to say, we can't throw food away because um, you know, the, they're dying. They're dying in Ethiopia. They, they're, so, they're so hungry. If there's a video, there's actually a beautiful video that's where the guy says, you know, I've done my part. I've been eating my food so that the starving people in Ethiopia, you know, and how has it contributed? How have I helped? Because like, it's not like you could send your food to, you know, to Ethiopia. It's crazy. It's such a crazy mentality. It's so weird. And we heard it our whole lives. It's so strange. Carbohydrates make me fat. I must have insulin resistance. It's not so important to be in good physical shape. I've never been slim, so it's just not possible for me. I will be deprived of my favorite foods. I think this might actually be true though. If, if I'm thin, my sister may feel sad because she isn't. That's a real reason. That's a real reason. You get a lot of people that are competitive and if you know, you, you, who's, the, who's the fat sister? You see it often on movies as well. I want to lose weight, but I just don't believe I can be successful at this or anything. 
I'm afraid to lose weight and become thin because men will find me attractive and take advantage of me. That's the trauma uh, factor again. If I get skinny and if I look gorgeous and if I look beautiful, then you know I might run the risk of being hurt again the way I was before. I have a slow metabolism. And even if I do lose weight, I can't keep it off. How many did you get? How many do you believe in? Five, 10, <laughs> all of them? Yes? No? <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so what can you actually do? Three. Well done, Chanel. Did you believe three of those? Really? Hey, well done. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so what can you actually do? The first thing you can do is come for therapy. Uh, I have my own therapy practice, and this is what I do. I deal with people that um, have been through trauma, and I help you to understand your trauma and to help you deal with it. That's the one thing you can do. The second thing is you can look at your limiting beliefs. Um, also, I do coaching and I focus on identifying your limiting beliefs and then I help you to change them so that we can actually um, instill, instill some positive and inspiring beliefs because obviously we're all here to be fantastic and great and to start living our best life. Um, and so, yeah, that's another thing that you can do. You can start practicing self-love and self-love obviously isn't easy. Um, because we've been taught so many things and we've all been taught that we're not good enough and we're not worthy. Uh, and self-love is definitely not a one day. You, it takes a long time and you've got to work through all your stuff and you've got to be brave to be able to do it. But if you are willing to take that journey and you can learn to love yourself, then obviously that is one way that you will definitely make changes in your weight. You can speak to Chanel, <laughs> our dietitian. Um, she can help you with understanding food, food labels. She's going to talk to us now about some more stuff. You can start to get an understanding of your emotional eating and why you eat the way that you do, because emotional eating is obviously a coping mechanism. It's not a good one, but it is one. Um, and just by being self-aware of what you're eating can make a huge difference. You can start to identify the difference between hunger, physical hunger, and emotional hunger. They're extremely different. You can see here both sides. You will be getting this presentation. We'll send it out with the link. Um, but they are different. And if you can start to recognize when you're actually hungry and when you're emotionally hungry, perhaps then you can distract yourself or come up with different ways to deal with the emotional hunger. Uh, exercise should be a celebration of what your body can do and not a punishment for what you ate. And I think a lot of people feel that way. I think we only do exercise because we absolutely have to. And most of the time we choose things that we absolutely hate. Um, but what you should do is actually find something you love. So whether that's uh, pole dancing or, you know, belly dancing or um, yoga, or if you love running like Chanel, then do that. But do something that you actually really enjoy. If you prefer walking, then walk. But find something that you really enjoy so that it's not a, it's not a punishment for you. Obviously, you need to drink a water that goes without saying. Can't believe how many people don't drink enough water. Um, and the sugar side, obviously, you need to avoid as much sugar as much as possible. Uh, say no to the donuts, rather pick an apple if you can. That's me. Cool. So let me take the time oh, now gosh, to yeah. introduce Chanel. Chanel is a registered dietitian. She received her BSc dietetics degree from the University of Northwest and her master's degree in dietetics. She focused on critical ill nutrition and sport nutrition from the University of Pretoria. She's worked in the government setting since 2012 until the beginning of 2020. She has also locumed in private hospitals during this time. She started her own practice, Nutri Fundi, in March of 2017. At Nutrifundi, she consults individual patients, especially athletes, weight loss patients, diabe diabe diabetics, and some GIT problems. I don't know what a GIT problem is, so please, that's going to be one of my questions. She currently serves on the Association of Dietetics of South Africa, Gauteng, South Branch. She's a comrades runner, which in itself is beyond impressive, and has successfully completed five consecutive comrades marathons and three roads trail mountain ultra marathons. This year would have been her six comrades, but due to COVID, that didn't take place. Please welcome Chanel. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so your first question, Athena, GIT is um, any gastrointestinal tract ah, uh, yes. problems. Okay. So IBS, IBD, um, right. BOD, ulcers, all of those. <laughs> 
As I okay, cool. Thank you. So, um, just something that I thought of um, while you were talking, Athena, about the emotional eating, um, is a lot of times we do like exactly like you're saying we do this because there's other issues and uh, maybe we're stressed or we're bored or or whatever. Um, so something that has been there's a lot of research and like a lot of dietitians and psychologists and everyone is actually saying this is to just they call it self soothing, which I actually I don't like that word so much it sounds like it's like with something to do with a baby um but there's a lot of other stuff that you can do instead of eating so um one of the the things because i see there's a lot of ladies on the chat today and one of those things are or, or is to go and take like a bubble bath i mean a lot of times we just need to relax and we don't need that chocolate but we can get the same feeling out of taking a bubble bath for instance so that i know that's not really the topic but i just thought of that while you were talking um so the topic that i wanted and to discuss with you guys tonight is the mindful eating so um when you're a dietitian there's always sort of two types of dietitians two, two schools of thought if you, if you think about it so we have the dietitians that work out meal plans like i like to do and we do everything in grams and in calories and everything because that's what we've been taught to do um but then also life happens um and then that is where the other part sort of falls in and that's the more mindful eating so i don't like to go the complete mindful eating route um if unless it's not completely necessary for a specific patient but i like to um emphasize and to to teach my patients the mindful eating way of eating in in a way that when it's when they go to like a special occasion so when it's maybe to a wedding or they're going away for a weekend or so that they don't eat they're not eating healthy for like three months and then they go away on holiday and they throw everything away so in that sense that's where i like to use the mindful eating thing so what i did is i did complete the the one thing i always tell my patients not to do i went on to google and i googled mindful eating and that is the definition that i got because I, I thought that is the definition most people would get if they go on to google so basically it says mindful eating is maintain, maintaining and in the moment awareness of the food and drink you put into your body observing rather than judging how the food makes you feel and the signals your body sends about taste satisfaction and fullness okay so like i say basically um that is a technique that you can help to control your eating habits especially on special occasions so basically what that involves is firstly to try and eat slower without a distraction that is something very important then also listening to the physical hunger cues and eating only um, only until you are full to also distinguish between the true hunger and the non-hunger triggers and engaging all your senses a lot of people tend to think that we only eat with your mouth which is not true you also eat with all your other senses we eat we look at the colors how it smells the sound textures all those things so in the practice i always use the example of of quickly eating maybe you're now on a diet or a meal plan or whatever you want to call it and now you told your husband and your husband is paying for you to go see a dietitian so but now you crave a chocolate so now you're driving in the traffic and you have the chocolate and you have a kit kat because you feel like you have to have a break and then there comes a taxi and the taxi is driving in front of you and you somehow put the whole kit kat in your mouth and before you know it you ate the kit kat you didn't even realize that you had the kit kat so don't do that be honest with your husband tell your husband listen i'm gonna cheat so would you maybe share the kit kat with me smell the kit kat look at the kit kat feel the kit kat tomorrow you won't crave it again but eaten in the traffic tomorrow you're going to want to have a, tra a, a traffic kit kat again so that is the senses thing um coming into play there and then also the the opposite sometimes it's nice if you can sort of um for a definition check at what the opposite is um of mindful eating so the opposite of mindful eating would be mindless eating okay and that actually sums it up very nicely so mindless eating would be eating just because you are eating and past being full so you just ignore all your body signals and you just eat for whatever reason it might be the trauma like you discussed or you are bored or you are at the wedding and you're not married yet or 
whatever, and you are just eating because of the situation. But mindful eating is listening to your body and then you stop when you are full. So you know your own body. Um, everyone is obviously different, so you have to know your own body. Then also you are only eating with your emotions, like we said, but the opposite of that would be is eating when your body tells you to eat. So you would know that your energy is low, you're maybe feeling dizzy, you're feeling shaky, your stomach is growling, like you have to listen to your body and you know only eat on those cues. Um, then also very important, mindless eating a lot of times goes with eating alone and eating random times and places. You see, there's the taxi and the car situation again. So don't do that. Rather eat with others. Um, research has shown that you um, tend to eat less if you eat with your friends and family instead of eating alone because <laughs> not you, Athena. <laughs> Um, and also set times and places. So make rules for yourself. You only eat at the table and not in front of the TV. If you know that is a problem, don't, don't do that. Um, then also eating and multitasking is a mindless eating. And I think all of us have done that before. Like we're in a meeting, quickly eating, or you may be listening to something on the, um, on the computer or you're driving or you're doing a, some other assignment or work and you're eating. Um, while as the mindful eating is you only eat, um, you, well, when you eat, that's the only thing you do. Then something else, and I, actually I read it and I thought this makes sense, but you have to explain it, um, is also when you are doing the mindless eating, you only sit at your table, now you're doing everything right, you sit at the table, you look at the burger and you eat the burger, that's it. Whereas the mindful eating, it's something nice that you can start to practice yourself, is to think of everything that went into, let's say, this burger. So all the ingredients, the farmers that had to do whatever farming they had to do, and all of that to actually make this burger possible. Um, and not only look at the end product. That, and I thought that's actually something, like such a nice thing to, to keep in mind. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you can quickly go on to the next slide for me. Um, so this picture I cannot take any credit for because I found it on Google, but it's really such a nice picture and I'm going to make a big one for my practice because it takes everything into account. Um, so this is some of the, the mindful eating techniques that we can do. So you'll see at the top right corner, it will say don't eat and watch TV. And that is actually applicable to all screens, not only TV, but also Instagram and Facebook and all of the different screens. So so just when you eat, just eat. Then also the one just below that, it says don't eat straight from the packaging. And I've seen that, I've done Fit Chef, Fit Chef a few times. And then you look at it in that small little bucky and you think, oh my word, that's such a small portion. But if you dish it out into a plate, it's actually like it's supposed to be. It's actually portion control. Do the same thing with McDonald's. Next time you go, go to McDonald's, they ask you, you want to upsize and you think, oh, it's just too rand, why not? Me? Then you upsize, but please just put it in a plate and you will be surprised at how big that portion really is. Same with the pizza. Most pizzas can't even fit on a plate, but we eat out of the box so we don't even realize how much we are eating. Um, then something that a lot of, and I mean, I like to talk and I like, so I think that sort of works together, the talking and the eating and the chewing and those things. Make sure that when you eat, you chew your food enough times. Ne? Okay, so like 30 times or more. I know it sounds weird and you're going to feel like you're getting some muscles here in your neck, but that's really important. A lot of times we just, we eat because we eat and we quickly because we have to go to the next meeting or whatever. Tonight or tomorrow, whenever you have your next meal, time yourself how long you are eating. It will be five minutes, I promise you. Tomorrow, try and add an extra minute or something or two minutes or three minutes just to actually realize um, how, how, how fast we are eating. Also with that, it's important to eat small uh, bites. Don't take that McDonald's burger into three um, big bites and then you're done. So remember we said um, we, we are using these mindful eatings in special occasions. So obviously I'm referring to McDonald's in the sense that we are going to eat McDonald's every day in the sense of McDonald's is now a special occasion. It's a birthday party or whatever. Enjoy that burger. Eat it in 30 or 40 bites and not only three. Enjoy it. 
Um, then also put your fork down or any cutlery down in between your, your uh, bites. So take a bite, put your fork down, and then you take the next bite. That would also help you to slow down a little bit. Then there's a big mentality like you were talking about the, um, the Africa children thing. There's also a lot of stuff going on with kids um, from like very young age. The mom and dad telling them that they cannot leave the table until the, the plate is cleared. Okay. Um, and that is a big, big, big thing I see in the practice why people are overeating because they, are, they have that mentality still. So don't have that. Remember, you can always have the rest of your meal the next day for lunch. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Um, then also remember it starts with your actual shopping list. So, um, in your house, if you have healthy stuff in your house, the chances are you're going to eat healthy food. So that is a important thing as well. And then lastly, try and go to a, a, a table or a occasion or like a wedding or whatever with a slight appetite, but not be super hungry because that is when you eat everything. So maybe have a bit of uh, like a fruit or something in the car or a little bit of water or something just to not be that 100% I can eat anything type of vibe. Um, and then also the number one tip I normally tell my pay or give my patients when they go to like a special occasion is to look at that um, plate in the middle of that picture. So that's the, the um, plate model. So you'll see on the left hand side, we have half a plate should be your veggies. And if I say veggies, I do not mean potato and sweet potato and pumpkin. I mean the other stuff that looks like the rainbow. So um, your carrots and maybe some broccoli and those types of things. Salad, all of that fits in there. So start with your plate, make sure half of it is full of the rainbow. And then a quarter of the plate can be your, um, your carbs, but good carbs, like um, brown pasta, brown rice, um, potato, sweet potato, those things. And then the other quarter can be a protein, like, a, um, like maybe they say some chicken or steak or whatever, but obviously with the fat cut off. Okay, cool. So then on the next slide, I asked everyone to bring a raisin or a small piece of fruit or anything with to the meeting. So I want you to now take that out. We're going to do a quick exercise. So I want you to have that in your hand and then I'm going to read to you what I want you to do. Okay, so first take the food and hold it between your finger and your thumb. Bring your attention to it. If it's a raisin or whatever other food it, fruit it is, look at it as if it is the first time that you are seeing this raisin in your life. You have never seen this fruit in your life before. Take the time to observe the raisin carefully. Really see it, gaze at it with care and full attention. Let your eyes explore every part of it. Noticing its shape, colors, and surfaces. Imagine its grooves where the light shines and the shadows as well. Rotate it and move the raisin between your fingers, continuing to explore its texture. Apply a small bit of pressure to notice whether it's soft or hard. You might, you might close your eyes if that helps you to focus and enhance your sense of touch. Recognizing this is a raisin, note any thoughts you might have about raisins, any memories about them, or feelings of liking or disliking them. Hold the raisin under your nose and inhale naturally. With each in-breath, notice any aroma or smell that arises. Bring awareness also to any effect in your mouth or stomach. Now bring the raisin slowly up to your mouth, noticing how your hand and your arm know exactly how and where to position it. Being aware if you are producing any more saliva as the mind and the body anticipate eating. Placing the raisin, place the raisin gently into your mouth without yet chewing. Hold the raisin in your mouth for at least 10 seconds. 
in these 10 seconds, explore it with your tongue, feel the sensation of having it in your mouth. Notice this, pause, and how it feels to take some time before eating the raisin. When you are ready, prepare to chew the raisin. Take one or two bites into and notice what happens, bringing your full attention to its taste and texture as you continue to chew this raisin. Take time to, um, yeah, okay. Uh, when you feel ready to swallow, you can swallow this raisin. Again, bring awareness to the sensation so that even this is um, being experienced uh, consciously. Lastly, notice what is left of the raisin as you sw swallow it and it travels down to your stomach. Notice how your body as a whole is feeling after completing this exercise. Okay, and then if you have a, a, a piece of paper and pen with you, I want you to just write down firstly, how was the experience, um, or was it the same, or was it different from how you normally eat something like a raisin or a fruit or a, let's say a grape or a banana or whatever type of fruit. Then secondly, um, what, if any, surprised you about this experience? Did the raisin maybe look different to you that you normally would think of a raisin? Did you think of maybe that one time that you, you uh, maybe took a bite of a, a rusk and you thought it was chocolate chip and it was a raisin? Um, <laughs> number three, what did you notice with the raisin or whatever food you chose in terms of sight, touch, sound, smell and taste? Would you ever think of a raisin the same or would it maybe be a bit different? Then number four, what thoughts of memories popped up while you were doing this exercise? <laughs> I can see Athena is thinking very deeply about the raisin experiences. Um, <laughs> and then the last one, what is one tip for yourself that you are going to take away from this experience to apply to your eating habits in the future? So I think... Yeah, it's important to, obviously you're not going to do this with all your food because you're going to constantly be eating. Um, but I think it is important to just sometimes do this exercise to just bring yourself back to food and eating and the taste and the color. And when you do catch yourself eating a Kit Kat in the traffic, that evening I want you to do this exercise with the raisin again in your house just to bring everything sort of back together. So that is me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was amazing. I, I was eating my nachi. I chose a nachi. <laughs> and it, it was, it's so, I mean, I love the smell, but I actually don't like fruit. I really don't. I don't like fruit. And as I was eating it, one, the juice had all gone. So I was like literally just eating this dry, like weird nachi thing. And um, I thought like, why don't I eat fruit? I really enjoyed that piece. It was so weird. I really enjoyed that. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> so next time you're going to smell it before you eat it. Yeah, next time I, think, <laughs> next time I eat an archer, I'm going to think about you. And I'm going to be really <laughs> slow and deliberate about it. Um, cool. So can, let's open up for questions. I've got one. Um, if you had to give our listeners, uh, our viewers here, uh, three top tips for eating healthy, what would it be and why? Okay, awesome. So I would definitely say the number one thing for me is to still to always have breakfast. So um, I think that thing that we've always heard when we were like little is like breakfast is the most important meal of the day is still very applicable. We, we do hear all these things about intermittent fasting or intermediate fasting, like someone told me today, it's actually intermittent fasting. Um, so I think we do hear about that. And the other day I saw a picture on Facebook that said, it's the, actually the millennials that just, they forget to eat breakfast and now they call it intermittent fasting. <laughs> so I thought that was very clever. Um, and yeah, so breakfast is still very applicable, but we do have to remember that it's not like 400 years ago when we were all staying on a farm and we had to run around and we had to walk to school and whatever. It's not like that anymore. So we can't have this very carb rich cocoa pops and whatever breakfast we want to have, we should definitely include beta carbs um, and a good protein. I think if we have a good protein in breakfast, it really helps sort of set the scene for the rest of the day, especially for ladies. It helps with the cravings and, and all those things. 
then I would, and I, I, I saw one of your um, reasons for not losing weight or what people tell themselves is the eating frequently. So every, anyone that knows me would know that I'm a big, big fan of eating frequent small meals. So that is um, another big top, uh, top tip that I would give. That really helps to control your blood glucose. It helps you to not eat anything and everything um, like it's your last meal for the rest of your life. Um, so that is very important. Um, and then also it helps you to know that in two hours from now, I'm going to have a snack. So it's okay if I'm a little bit hungry or if I'm not 100% completely stuffed after my lunch because I'm going to have something a little bit later. Um, and then lastly, I think definitely in this lockdown time, we all have heard, um, have heard that thing of, okay, I'm going to start on Monday. All diets start on Monday. <laughs> all, all exercise programs start on Monday. Ne? <laughs> so, and then also by Thursday, all of this is democor, and then we restart again on Monday. Okay, so I would say do not make, do not let a cheat meal turn into a cheat month, okay, yeah. or a year, or a lifestyle. Yeah. So if you make a mistake, if you eat the chocolate, in the car it's okay that evening you go back to your plate model and you are back on your normal healthy eating habits so don't let it no don't get despondent don't get demotivated it doesn't matter it's one meal one healthy meal won't make you healthy and one unhealthy meal won't make you unhealthy cool cool okay um i've got another one i don't know if there's any questions on the chat let me just double check but uh I've got another, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, we know that there isn't bad and good foods. Food, you know, food is food is food. Um, and it's only food that we should eat in smaller portions. So can you give us some tips maybe on how to, you know, read those, those food labels? Yes, yes, definitely. So I think that's a big problem with a lot of people think that dietitians are the food police. Okay. And I'm not, I promise I'm not. I also eat chocolate. I also eat whatever, but obviously not every day and in the right amount and you know all of that that we've spoken about so i think a lot of times people really want to be healthy and they are trying to make the right decision but maybe they just don't know what food to buy remember i said it's important that if you have healthy food in your house then you would probably eat healthier so i mean now you are all in this you're gonna go and you're gonna buy all the healthy food but then you don't know what to buy so Firstly, the labels can be very confusing. Um, I want to just put your attention to that you get two different columns in the, on the label. You get the one that says 100 grams, and then you get the portion size. Mm. Okay, so both of those are very important. Firstly, we use the 100 grams if you want to compare food A with food B. Okay, so if you want to compare full cream milk with fat-free milk because your dietitian said you must drink fat-free and you do not trust her. You want to compare the two. You look at 100 mils compared to the 100 mils. Okay. Because you have to compare apples with apples. All right. Then obviously you are not going to drink milk, for instance, only 100 mils. You probably have a cup in the day or whatever. So then we also have to look at the portion size. Okay. But then it is very important to make sure that you know what a portion size is and also what the size of the packaging is. So if you look at something like jelly beans, those packages are usually 75 grams, okay? Go and look at the portion size. It will say it's got 15 grams of carbs, but the portion size is 25 grams. So there's actually three portions in one of those small packets of jelly beans or jelly babies. And we all eat a packet like that by ourselves, right? okay, which is fine, but just remember it is three portions and not one portion, so you have to check that portion times three. So, if you are counting calories, or if you're checking your carbs, or if you're following a meal plan that the dietitian gave you, or whatever, that is very important the portion size part of the label. And then also, we have to compare apples with apples, we can't go and compare a packet of bacon with a chocolate it's not the same thing you can compare a chocolate with a jungle oats bar because you want to know which one is the better option or you can compare the way less bacon with the normal bacon that you can do so i think it's very important to also make sure that what are you actually checking are you just reading the food labels because i said you must or what's going on um, i'm thinking now the one time i asked the patient are you reading your food labels sir um, and he's like yes yes i am 
So I'm like, what are you checking? And he says, but like very full, a con- lot of confidence. He says, you know what, Chanel? I check the price. <laughs> so obviously that's important as well, but that's not what we are talking about now. <laughs> um, and then obviously the last thing is it really depends on what um, food you are looking at. If you're looking at dairy products like cheese and maybe yogurt and milk, there we want to look at the fat content. Um, obviously, if you, are, if you have osteoporosis or whatever, then you'll look at the calcium. But when we are looking at dairy, we want to look at the fat. Um, when we look at the carbohydrate foods, that can be a chocolate or it can be biscuits or it can be provitas or popcorn or any of those. We also want to look at the fiber. We want to look at the carbohydrates. But very importantly, we want to look at the sugar and the added sugar, which is important. So um, if you think of something like Jelly Babies, it will probably say 15 grams of carbs and then of which sugar will probably be 14. Um, whereas if we look at something like Provitas, it will also say 15 grams of carbohydrates, but then of added sugar will be two or three. So that is that is important to look at. Um, the meat, we will definitely look at the fat content again, like the bacon example that we used. And then a lot of people do also check the sodium content. So if you um, are hypertensive, you have high blood pressure, the sodium is also an important one to look at. It is important for everyone, but definitely more important for someone that does have hypertension. Cool, thank you, great. Okay, um, uh, there's no questions on the chat bar. If anybody's got a question, let us know. Um, I do have one more, uh, but there's not, if anybody's got any, let us know. Um, so we know that there obviously isn't a one size fits all from, from a diet perspective, right? So, you know, what I do is not necessarily gonna work for somebody else. Are there any general rules that kind of do stick to most people that you haven't already covered? Yes. So, um, and I think a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there. We, if you switch on Netflix, you see, what's it? Game changers. If you switch on Facebook, you see keto. If you are doing CrossFit, you see paleo. So it is just all over and we don't know what to believe anymore. So what I do see a lot in my practice is people take their favorite part of whatever diet. So they take the lacquer fat from keto. They take the lacquer meat from the paleo. And then they take the lack of beans because now it's a nice hype word to say that you are plant-based. So they take the beans from the plant-based diet. And what they're actually doing is they're just eating calories, 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 calories. And there's no method in all of this. So um, obviously, like, like you said, there isn't a one size fits all. Um, and if someone wants to be a vegan or they want to do plant-based, obviously I would recommend them to see a dietitian so that we can make sure it is very, you know, a balanced meal plan, even though it is a specific meal plan. But in South Africa and actually all different countries, we have stuff that we call the food-based dietary guidelines. Okay, so that is rules that have rules that has been set there by the governing bodies. And if I say governing bodies, I do not mean the government. I mean all the different dietitians and doctors and research that has been done in this country. So our rules would be different from another country's because we have different problems in our country. So again, if you are diabetic or if you're hypertensive or whatever, see a doctor, see a dietitian, this is not for you. If you are a happy, healthy person, then I would recommend looking at the food-based dietary guidelines. And they, there's 11 of them in South Africa. So first, the first one is enjoy a variety of food. And I really, that's my favorite one of all of them because they've got the word enjoy. And that is, I think, where everything, what we actually said tonight comes into play. We have to have a healthy relationship with food. So if you're not enjoying your food, what is the point in eating? So that is the one thing. And then obviously a variety, different colors, different nutrients, all of that. Then the second one is be active. And also that is the only one of the 11 rules that is written with the exclamation mark. So it just tells you how important it is in South Africa for us to be active. So like you said, Athena, it doesn't have to be running or jogging or cycling or swimming. It can be whatever you like and it needs to be something that you like. 
And then thirdly, we have, it says, make starchy foods part of most meals. And I know here people always look at me like I'm crazy. Um, remember, starchy food is vegetables, it is fruit, it is a little bit of dairy, it's not chocolate and chips. Okay, so there's a, a lot of bad vibes with starch. I just think it's, it's just bad press. Um, then also, this is where the plant base comes in. Eat dry beans, split peas, lentils, and soya regularly. So dietitians that never in my life I've said to someone not to go plant-based. But I do have a problem with people going plant-based just because they saw it on Netflix and now they want to change their whole diet. Do a meatless Monday. Do a fish Friday. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, you can definitely incorporate that. Then obviously also a lot of, um, it says eat plenty of vegetables and fruit every day. Not Mondays when my diet starts, every day. That's important. Um, have milk, mass, or yogurt every day. Okay. So again, low fat or fat free because that is saturated fat. So rather go for that. But you can have dairy every day. A lot of people, there's a lot of beliefs out there saying that you cannot have dairy. Um, then listen to this one. Fish, chicken, lean meat, and eggs can be eaten daily. Okay, ne? doesn't say it needs to be eaten daily and it doesn't say it should not be eaten. It says it can be eaten. So we can still do our meatless Monday. We can, I'm happy with that. That's perfect. Then drink lots of clean, safe water that we did discuss already. There's lots of stuff that you can add to it. Those new fancy um, enhancing drops. You can add to your water to make it taste nice. You can have those fancy bottles with the fruit in, that you put, put into the top of the bottle and then it, it's like fruit infused. Also, I get a question a lot about now in winter about coffee and tea contributing to your water. Okay, so the rule is if it's coffee and tea, it does not count towards your two liters of water unless if it is herbal tea. If it's herbal tea, you can count it towards your, your water for the day. Then use fats sparingly, choose vegetable oils rather than hard fats. So that is where the canola and the olives and those types of things come in. General rule is if it is hard by room temperature, it is not a good fat. It if, if it is like a, um, like a fluid stuff um, at room temperature, then you can have it. So like if it's an oil type of thing, then you can have it. If it's hard, it's not a good oil or a good fat. Then the second to last one, use uh, sugar and foods high in sugar as well as drinks sparingly. So dietitians would always say, rethink your drink, because we are always so focused on eating healthy, eating healthy, but then we have two liters of coke a day, or we have 12 cups of coffee with three sugar and cremora and hazelnut syrup in it. Um, and then we, we don't understand why we're not losing weight. So think of what you are drinking and then the sugar obviously in your food as well. And then lastly, it's the salt. Use salt and foods high in salt sparingly. So again, it's not really only the salt, it's more the sodium part that I did speak about a little bit with the labels. Um, yeah, so salt is a very broad term. Check your, because now what people go and do is they change the labels. It doesn't say salt, it says sodium. So anything that says sodium on the label, check the ingredients, check that it's not too, too high, it's not good for us. That, that is the 11 rules of South Africa. <laughs> Very cool, thank you. Uh, we had a question, uh, Pam asked, any tips on how to stay motivated in terms of sticking to a healthy diet and losing weight? We, we have no motivation at the moment in lockdown. It happens, it happens. So I think um, we said a lot of stuff tonight. Né? And if you are now going to go tomorrow and you're going to try and do all 50 stuff that we spoke about, you are going to fail. I can tell, I'm going to guarantee you, you're going to fail. So I would say um, try and pick three things. Maybe pick if you know you do not eat your breakfast. Say, I'm going to have breakfast. I'm going to try and exercise three times a week or whatever. Pick three things and you write it down. But then I want you to think of like a school roster when you were still in school. Né? You write down on the one side the three things you want to do. And then at the top, you write Monday to Sunday. Okay. And then you make how many blocks. So if you want to have breakfast every day, it's seven blocks. If you want to train three times a week, 
that is three blocks. Okay, so now we're already on 10 blocks. And then you count the blocks, and then every day or every time in that week that you do what you are doing, you give yourself a star. <laughs> like you would do with your kids, like when they're doing their chores. You give a star, you make a tick, whatever. And at the end of the week, you actually count and you give yourself a percentage. Okay, because a lot of times we are so focused on that one day that it was called and I didn't train that we forget about the other four days that you did actually run. Okay, or you did go to the gym or whatever. So I think yeah, that's important to sort of give yourself credit. Um, and then also don't be too hard on yourself. Remember, like I said, one cheat meal, it's okay. It's really fine. And then lastly, very important, don't only focus on your scale. Okay, that is one number. One number cannot define you, okay? Anyone that has been to my practice before would know that we look at a lot of other numbers and not that one number. So rather feel how you feel in the morning when you get up. Do you have more energy? Do you feel like going to train? How's your clothes feeling? How is your mood swings going, you know? All of those is a lot, like a, a better indicator of how your diet and eating healthy is going and not only the number on the scale. Because after eating healthy for three days, people want to be down two or three kgs and then they get demotivated and then they go straight to McDonald's. So that is what I would say. We had a um, Johan. Johan raised his hand. I think he's got a question. Are you unmuted, Johan? Yes, I'm un unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, thank yes. you. <laughs> now, I just want to say from a um, training perspective, I've been also all my years um, training and running and cycling. And if you want to lose weight, um, I feel is the best way to train is to train in the morning before you add something to eat. Because if you do that, you lose more fat than if you train in the afternoon after you had all your meals, meals during the day. Because then you're tending to, to basically burn the meals and, instead of the fat. Thank so you. that's the one thing I want to say. Mm -hmm. And then also just on the mindful eating, I like coffee and especially cappuccinos and stuff like that. So I find myself very often in a coffee shop or uh, somewhere, mug and bean or somewhere mm -hmm. to have a cappuccino and then I will finish it and then I'll think to myself, I, I didn't even enjoy this because I was thinking about other stuff or okay. was busy on my phone. So that's just basically the same thing if you compare that with having your meal and really enjoy your meal, what we also discussed earlier on. Yeah. And then lastly, um, Chanel, I know you can't do anything about this, but the older you get, unfortunately, the, um, the tables and the labels on all these um, stuff that you get in the shops are so small written that it frustrates the hell out of me. And then I can't read it and then I just ignore it. And then when I get home, I even with my glasses sometimes, I battle to read it. So it will be nice if I can print it a little bit bigger for the people, everyone to read it. Mm -hmm. So that's my input for it for, for tonight. Thank okay, you. cool. Thank you. So um, just a comment on the first one with it, training in the morning. Also, I read a quote the other day on Facebook. It says, if you train in the, you have to train in the morning um, before your brain figures out what yeah. you're actually doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that also actually fits in there. And yes, it does burn more fat. So I would just not recommend to train on an empty stomach if you're going to train longer for an hour and a half. If it's under an hour and a half, definitely you can you can train without eating or in a fasted state. Um, and then I agree with the, the coffee comment, um, obviously. And then the, the labels, I definitely do agree. Um, and I, I get very irritated with the labels if some of the labels are in calories and some of them are in kilojoules. So that's maybe something also I must mention that to get from calories to kilojoules, you have to multiply by 4.2. <laughs> okay, it is the same thing. It is like paying for something in, in dollars and paying for something in rands. It is the same thing. You pay the same for it. It's just in a different um, manner or whatever. So that is something important. But I think it's with all these flippant legislations coming out about the labels that they are printing them smaller and smaller because they have to put in all that extra information. So I, I definitely, I'm 30 and I also sometimes have that problem with the labels. <laughs> it's hard. Thanks, Johan. Thanks for those questions. Is there anyone else that's got any questions? Nothing's been on the on the chat group. Is that it? Any okay. comments? Anything any, yeah, that you any maybe comments. want to add or that you maybe learned in this session? Or 
Yeah, maybe something that stood out that you learned. Nothing. They flabbergasted. <laughs> I don't think they want to talk because <laughs> they're scared. <laughs> go, Johan. I, I think, yeah, go. Okay, it's, it's not me, my, myself. I, I don't really ask the question as my wife, <laughs> but she, she wants to know why do we need to drink so much water per day? If you drink cold drink or coffee and Good all these question. other things, why, why do you need to drink just pure water every day? Okay, so our bodies need the water. It, our cells are made up 70% of water. So it needs the water to work 100%. It can also actually increase your metabolism if you, um, if you drink more water. And I mean, who doesn't want a faster metabolism? Okay. But also something that is important, and that is why I am a fan of drinking tap water, um, is because there is all these minerals and stuff in the water that we actually need. So, I mean, I know my dad that's on the chat can vouch for that. If you do not have enough electrolytes in your body, your body doesn't actually absorb the water. So you can technically be dehydrated with the water in your stomach. Okay, so we need those electrolytes. So obviously, the, that um, um, situation I'm talking about now was a running situation, not a normal day-to-day -day situation. So in our normal lives, we need that extra um, minerals in the water to actually get the water into the cells and the cells to work. Okay, then also obviously in the other stuff that we drink, like the coffee and the tea, there's a lot of caffeine in there that can sometimes dehydrate us even more. Um, in a lot of the other cool drinks, there's a lot of sugar. In the fruit juice, there's a lot of sugar. And then it doesn't actually give us the benefit of the water. So that's why we're saying the, the herbal teas doesn't have all of that. It doesn't have any sugar. It doesn't have caffeine. It doesn't have any of those things. So that is why we can count it towards the water. Okay, but then you're saying that we're not putting honey into our herbal teas. Yes, yes. Okay. Just water. Just the tea Just bag. Water and in your, yes, in your herbal tea. Because <laughs> the minute we put honey, we've got all this extra sugar. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, honey is healthy. A lot of people also ask me, honey compared to sugar, Should I, yeah. is it good? Is it not good? Um, and then I love people saying to me, yo, I drink two or three teaspoons in my sh uh, of, of sugar in my coffee, but it's brown. Don't worry, it's brown yeah. sugar. <laughs> because I just told them to eat brown bread. So, um, yeah, that is obviously also not ideal. Sugar is sugar. Also, honey has got the same amount of calories than, than sugar has got. Um, it just has some other properties. It's a bit of an anti-inflammatory. It's got some um, it, it, nice protection um, stuff in them and whatever. So they are healthier compared to sugar, but it's still got the same amount of calories. And remember, we said we do not want to drink our calories. Okay, so rather do not add any extra calories to our drinks. Okay. Uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, Carmine. Is it Carmine or Carmine? Carmine. You don't know Carmine, hey, Charmaine? <laughs> Chanel, you don't know her? No, no. no. Okay, Carmine. I hope I've said it right. She said, I love the practical aspect with the raised and dried fruits. Thank you for the session. Thank you. I'm happy. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. There's no more questions. Um, I think that's everything. Cool. Do you want to say anything else? Uh, no, just thank you that everyone was here. And we will send out an email. Um, Athena, you do have the names of the people that were here, no? Yeah. yeah. So but we'll I send, think out, we'll send email. out to everybody, I think, because we did tell yeah, everybody it would so. be recorded. Eh? Yeah. So we'll send out a link to the recording, which will be on our YouTube channels to go and watch again. And then also the, um, the slides. And we will, uh, we can probably do like a, just a quick questionnaire afterwards to see if everyone enjoyed it. We'll do that afterwards. Cool. I just Thanks. want to say thank you so much to everybody that's here and I really appreciate your time and uh, shout if you need us in any way. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Okay. Bye everybody. If you click in the meeting, you'll, 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 Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you.
Ek sê, ek vraag jylle my sikke moeilike vraag, nie. Sure. How do you think it went? <laughs> Good, I think it went very well. And you? Oh, hang on one second. Let me just push stop. Hang